this is a most unusual Sunday, this World Communion Sunday, this national day of recognizing those and remembering those men, women, teens, and children across the globe and here in the United States who's tested positive to COVID-19, those who have survived and those who have died. Today, I would like us to pause before the sermon to lift up the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, who is at Walter Reed National Hospital this morning. I would ask that we'd have a moment of silence to lift up President Trump for his healing, his wife Melania for her healing, and all who were afflicted and affected by COVID-19. But let's pause for President Trump. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The Ten Commandments, the wicked tenants and good fruit-bearing seekers of God, and the call to spiritual maturity in following Christ greet us in the scriptures on this World Communion Sunday. Coupled with our National COVID-19 Remembrance Day, in which we're called to remember the 7,310,625 people who have tested positive in the United States, including 301,539 in the last seven days, now including the President and the First Lady and other key leaders in Capitol Hill and the White House, and the more than 208,118 who have died, including Gina Harris and Carl Miller and many others who we can name in our lives and our families and our orbit and circle of friends. We find ourselves challenged and likely to tune out and turn off worship and the news just because it's so overwhelming. But today, is also St. Francis's feast day. In his memory, I ask you to stick with me. In his honor, remember his words, start by doing what is necessary, then by doing what is possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Remember his words, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Allow me to say a few words, because as a preacher I believe it's necessary, about each of the texts, and then I'm going to sit down. I promise it will be my gift to you on this World Communion Sunday, in memory of our little saintly friend and every creature that on earth dwells. Exodus 20, 1 through 17 is God's gift of 10 commandments to humanity. God gives the law to Moses as a way to structure society, set forth a moral code and ethics that will guide the people out of the wilderness and into freedom and promise. Here are God's top 10 commandments. In case you weren't listening earlier, and I'm going to use the words simplifying them with the help of Eugene Peterson in the message. Here's the top 10. Put God first, only God. Number two, don't put other God images or other kinds of desires for gods anywhere in your life. Number three, don't misuse or abuse God's name. God does not like irreverent use of God's name. And I would add that most of us don't either. So let's just do that. Fourth, Keep the Sabbath day holy. Work six days, not seven. You need to rest on the seventh day because you're not better than God. 
God took one day to rest, you can do it too. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, no murder. Number seven, no adultery. Number eight, no stealing. That includes elections. Number nine, no lies about your neighbor. Number 10, no lusting after your neighbor's house. And don't set anything else in your neighbor's domain into your field of lust either. Martin Luther referred to these 10 commandments as the greatest gift of God's grace. Later, he called the Beatitudes the greatest gift of God's law of love. That flips the script for most of us. We think of the Ten Commandments as the greatest laws, but he believed that, in fact, God's laws were graceful to us and guided us, and God's grace was to be followed as law. Interestingly, Moses receives the tablets of God's laws on the mountaintop of Sinai, and when he brings them down to the people, they are boldly sinning, to paraphrase uh, Dr. Luther. He smashes God's chiseled words and they become shards of grace, fragments of truth. God never speaks of this act by Moses. God never says anything about this breaking of the tablets. God's silence at the crushing of the law is fascinating, probably worth a whole sermon series in itself. For today, just let us remember that God has maintained silence all these years, having delivered the law, even though it was crushed. We need to listen to the silence of God. In the spirit of St. Francis and Martin Luther, may we live fully into the Ten Commandments, God's greatest gift of grace to us all, for all generations. In Matthew, we encounter the parable of the wicked tenants. As with all the parables, it begins with something like this. Listen to another parable. There was a man who planted a vineyard, who put a fence around it, dug a wine press, and built a watchtower. Seemingly more allegorical than parabolic, this story twists and turns and finally ends with a judgment on people who produce bad fruit and a blessing on people who produce good fruit, that is, the fruit of the kingdom of God. In the end, our storyteller is celebrating the joy of good fruit, which we can all get behind. Everybody likes good fruit. Nobody likes bad fruit. Everyone wants to identify with the joy of good fruit people. We all want to believe that we are in the community of the blessed, we're in the right church, we're in the right group within the church, and so on and so forth. But the story doesn't say anything about that. The story doesn't talk about membership in the right community. It will automatically place us among the joy-filled people producing the fruit of the kingdom of God, does it? It doesn't say that. The story delivered from the heart of an early Christian community, squabbling with the synagogues down the street, arguing with Christians across the Mediterranean, makes no guarantees that Christians are granted special entrance into the kingdom of God. In fact, it makes no promises of the coming of the kingdom of God to Christians at all. It is not a story about good Christians and disobedient Jews or renegade pagans. Rather, as the owner of the vineyard, read God, is expecting good fruit growing out of a righteous living, out of human caring, out of courageous witnessing. Maybe God is not so silent after all. These are all qualities established long before Jesus in this parable. We desire to be God's good fruit in these times, but it's not as simple as it seems, unless, like William J. Toms has written, we live like the only Bible that some people will ever read. Let our actions speak louder than our words. Finally, the Apostle Paul gives us a gift in Philippians 3. Paul is calling us to, uh, and calling the Church of Philippi and all of us to know Christ. He wants us to lay aside the righteousness of our own accomplishments 
in favor of the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. He wants us to stop talking about ourselves and to focus on Jesus. Paul accomplishes nothing alone, he tells us. All the goodness of the gospel comes from God. All righteousness belongs to God. And anyone who accomplishes anything never gets there by themselves alone. And he would say never gets there without the Spirit of God. That's true for faith. It's true for life. And I think it's true for all the work we do in this world as well. There's a story about President Kennedy visiting NASA back in the early days of our space program. As he entered the building, he stopped to meet one of the men working there, one of the custodians, and he asked him what his job was. The man answered him, I'm going to the moon. To which President Kennedy smiled and said, me too. This is a great example of Paul's point. All of us working together for a singular purpose to achieve something that we could never do by ourselves, graced by the presence of God. Washing hands, social distancing, wearing masks may seem like flying to the moon for some of us as we battle COVID-19. But unless we do it together, this spaceship will never leave the launch pad and we will continue to see rising numbers of sickness and death. It's that simple. So let our response be, I want to get out of COVID-19 and then do it. Let us hope and pray it today that our president and first lady are not among those who don't make it through this pandemic. If we have learned anything in 2020, we should all agree that COVID-19 is a really good virus at doing what it does. So we have to be equally good in doing and pushing forward in our battle against this deadly coronavirus. If it's that tough, we have to be tougher. And what seems so weird is that toughness is measured by masks, hand washing, and social distancing. But that's what it is. Paul acknowledges that he has not yet arrived at the goal of following Christ. The real goal, he says, in fact, is the resurrection of the dead, connecting us for eternity with all those who have gone before us starting with Jesus. To get to this goal, we need to walk with God all the way. We need to practice generosity. We need to practice kindness. And we need to live into grace and love. He calls this spiritual maturity. How do you and I reach spiritual maturity? In the words of Paul, we need to press on to make this faith our own. This can't simply be your mother or your grandmother's faith. It can't be your father's or your grandfather's faith. It has to be yours. You have to press on to make it your own. We don't get to be Christians based on what others have done. We have established ourselves as people of faith and we have to do what gets us further along the path in the grace of God. I always say to my confirmands, and I said it last Sunday as we began our journey together, this is about you. This is about your connection. This is about your choice. This is about how you pray, how you live, how you speak and act right and justly. It's not about your mom or dad. It's you. So make this faith your own. Remember, in summary, we have God's top 10, we're called to be good fruit people. I know that doesn't sound right when you just throw it out there like that, but be fruity and good, right? And press on to make this faith your own. On this World Communion Sunday, like none other we have ever had in celebrating World Communion Sunday, I invite you to come to God's table of grace on tiptoes. Do not step forward with any self-righteous arrogance. Just say to yourself, I made it here today by the grace of God. Come seeking to be joyful fruit bearers of God's kingdom. 
But as you do, come knowing that good fruit is born by righteous living, by human caring, by courageous witnessing, not by wishful thinking. As you come to the table today, pause to consider all those who won't be at the table with us this year, that can't make it to the table today, those who have died, those who have no access to God's table, those who are hungry, those who are thirsting and will have no elements of food and drink today at all. They won't have the bread of life. They won't have the cup of blessing. Think of them as you come to the table. They are our sisters and brothers. They are all across the globe and they're across the street as well. They won't be joining us today in spite of the truth that Jesus Christ the founder of this feast has opened his arms to every single child of God to come and sit at the table. So come on tiptoe. Come now. Amen.